Welcome to the Help Me, I'm Middle-Aged podcast. My name is Rob. And I'm Rob too. We're just two middle-aged guys who love meeting interesting people and hearing their stories. Our goal is to bring you interesting guests and their unique stories to inspire, educate, and entertain. So sit back, relax, because here we go. And welcome to the Help Me on Middle Age podcast. My name is Rob. And I'm Rob too. And today our wonderful guest is Adam Silverstein, a lifelong uh, enthusiast of av- aviation, aviation yes, pilot, uh, professional uh, builder. And thanks for coming out. We'd love to have to look forward to this conversation. Well, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Yeah, I know. It's definitely have a lot of things we want to drive or jive, jive, jump into really to see what, uh, you know, your history is and, and kind of give us the details of that. It was very exciting doing some research on what you've done in the past. So uh, great. Great to be here. Yeah, yeah, it should be fun. Now, um, now this this passion for aviation, uh, if my reading your bio correctly, it was around like your early 20s. Yeah, well, you know, like every every kid has a passion for aviation, I suppose, whether it's playing with airplanes or right. or just looking up at the sky. But for me, um, I always had this passion for it, but no direction. Um, mm-hmm. Didn't have a parent, didn't have a friend, didn't have anybody that I knew that was involved in aviation. Right. And um, I had to kind of find it for myself. And it was a byproduct of maybe a, a bit of a will to, to try to find a way to get flying. And uh, mm-hmm. I managed to do that by going to a small airport and working my way into the system. Oh, very interesting. And as you had mentioned, Rob, there was no like parents who were uh, pilots in the past. And no. What, uh, what did your parents do or your dad do? Well, my dad was a, was a builder, hence my occupation. Right. Uh, my mom was a homemaker and, and uh, stayed home like the traditional moms did at that time. Sure. And uh, it, was, uh, it was good. Life was good. Um, but I just needed more. Right. Um, I had an uncle who was a very um, much more outgoing than my parents. They lived a very modest, hardworking life, mm-hmm. whereas my uncle was running around with motorcycles <laughs> and doing all these crazy things that we didn't do. Right, right, right. right. So he was a big influence on me. Okay. And in, uh, I read somewhere you, you were thinking of going into general contracting just like your parents or your dad. Yeah, I, I did. Yeah. Um, and you know, for the most part, it's been a good, very good career, and uh, yeah. and I've enjoyed it. It's it's um, like every job; it's a job, right? It has its ups and downs, I'm sure. And, <laughs> in this business, very up and down. Right. If the economy goes up, life is good. If it goes down, you lose money. Yeah. Well, how how has COVID been? I just bring that wonderful subject back into the light here. Well, it gave me a three month vacation. There you go. Okay. Um, I mean, I literally stayed home initially for three months, which is just unheard of. First right. time in your uh, professional career. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, there were some things that could be done, but you know, f- honestly, people didn't want you in their house. Right. 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 They didn't want to see you. They didn't want to deal with you, and, and there was a lot of unknowns certainly back then. So. Sure. Um, yeah, it, it was a, it was a slow, scary time. Yeah. You know? yeah. So how when you met first decide that you want to go into aviation and you start showing up at the airport, like what, what was your first interaction like? Like how what, what did you do? Like you're a young kid, you don't have any experience, you don't have any family members. It seems from the outside to be well, not a rich man's game, but you got a couple bucks. You want to fly a plane, right? You know, it's funny. I can look back now, uh, many years later, but. When I got involved in aviation, um, I was just a little kid and didn't know much of anything. Mm-hmm. And uh, um, it took many years to develop um, the skills, relationships with people, the ability to afford um, uh, airplanes that were, um, you know, that gave me the ability to do what I wanted. Right. Um, and that's taken a long time. It doesn't happen overnight. And... To get to the point where you are a good, qualified, um, respected pilot mm-hmm. um, doesn't happen overnight. Yeah, I've a been lot doing of hours, it a long right? time and a lot of flying and a lot of um, uh, skills from flying aerobatics to just uh, different ratings that you pick up over the years. It's, it's, just, it's a skill set like anything else. You don't become a piano player overnight. Right. right. It's true. It's true. What, uh, what did you start off with? What was the... Uh, the v- well, I started in gliders, um, right. which was uh, really what I thought was the cheap way of getting into aviation. Okay. And I'm not sure it really was, but it was a, a skill that is uh, hard to achieve uh, in aviation. Um, 
Whereas in powered aircraft, uh, you're basically taking off and landing wherever you choose. Right. In a glider, there's a lot bigger thought process and how you're going to get back to either the field you took off from or another field. It sounds like the glider thing to me, like it, 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 it's a little mind boggling. So you well, don't I, have an engine. You don't have an engine. <laughs> but you're, you're pulled up, right? Uh-huh. Yes. You're, you're towed by another airplane right. and you get off at a specific altitude and, and you, um, you get to uh, experience uh, s- s- what we call soaring. Right. Um, and there's a lot more to it. You're not just gliding down towards the ground. Well, ultimately you are. But, right. but you are using um, different techniques. You're using thermals, wave flying. There's people that have stayed up for extreme amounts of time. I've been up for over five hours. Really? In a glider? In a glider. And that's wow. that's by no means any records. That's uh, right. that's just what I did. And then you were able to land where you wanted to. Uh, yeah, for the most part, yes. I landed where I wanted to. I landed back at the airport I, I departed from. But um, you know, we used uh, thermals just as birds do. They've done forever and ever. Mm-hmm. That's um, just a certain wind temperature coming your way. There to- are there there's um, uh, thermals can be many different things, but the, yeah. the most generic is just hot air rising. Right and um, cold air descending. And we get into those thermals and you ride them up. And believe it or not, using birds as one of your, your focal points when you see the birds and they're not flapping and they're just thermaling, well, right. that's, yeah. that's the place to go. Okay, that makes sense. Then. So yeah. there's a lot of skill involved, of course, and a lot of judgment. Um, uh, you don't have as many options as you do in an airplane, a powered airplane, where you can say, well, <laughs> you know, we're gonna go 100 miles and we're gonna land at that airport and life is good. Now, do you now for gliding? Do you have to be uh, a little more weather uh, cooperation? From oh, I'd say all of it does. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, f- you know, f- uh, flying is a judgment um, and a lot of judgment. Uh, I, I know they talk about that everybody one day will be flying an airplane, and I just <laughs> really don't think that's going to happen in most of our lifetimes because, unless it could be completely autonomous. Mm. where very few things have to be decided, um, it's not going to happen. Yeah. No. Uh, Going, even just planning a flight 500 miles away takes a fair amount of experience and a fair amount of time to plan and execute. And uh, it's just not like getting in your car and driving to a destination. Now, the first time I heard this term was when JFK Jr. passed away Mm. in his plane. It was called instrument uh, rated pilot. Yes, he was an instrument. Well, he was not, was an, not an instrument. Was not an instrument pilot. Pilot. And, and, yeah. and, and and that's like a huge difference because you you have to. You, you know, I remember. That a little bit? I remember the day that he he had died. I was actually at our airport. Um, it was a, a very hazy yeah, day. Yeah, summertime. Right? It was summertime, and he was flying at night or dusky when he took off, and uh, at night over the water in haze. Mm. That's a disaster. That's hard for an instrument rated pilot really? who's competent and capable um there's a lot of variables and it was he was doomed to fail unfortunately uh um, that's something that uh an instrument pilot would have been far more qualified to have done so, so the the progression is um you what is when you're an instrument rated pilot and then when you're just sort of like flying by looking at mother nature, you, you know, you, you're losing la- landmarks, right. right? So how does that progression happen? Well, again, once you lose the ability to see the ground and mm-hmm. see the horizon, mm-hmm. all bets are off. And as an instrument pilot, you're trained to believe your instruments and believe your training. And it's it's not easy. An instrument rating is a probably the most difficult rating in aviation to and, get. And you have that, right? I do. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and it took me many years to get it, um, and I don't use it often. In fact, I'm not even current right now, but, uh, but, I, but I have that ability, and uh, it's, it, the training is, uh, is, is probably the most valuable thing you learn in aviation. Hmm. Can we back up for a second? The um, piloting a glider versus a regular plane, is there a difference? Oh, yeah, there are different ratings. So a glider rating is, uh, you have to take a written test. You have to... Uh, perform all the things that are required, instruction, and then you take a check ride, you get a license, Mm -hmm. Um, which is not unlike a power rating. It's just a different rating. Okay. But you don't have to be a power uh, individual to get a a glider? No, no, no. They're they're separate ratings, but you do, if you want to get a multi-rating and an instrument rating, those require 
um, you, you know, uh, they're separate ratings and they require certain airplanes to okay. fly in and so on. Yeah, I would think a glider is much more difficult to, to judge on certain things because you don't have control in every aspect. It's, it's interesting. I, I would kind of agree. That, but that being said, you can get a glider rating at 16. So, you know, in New Jersey, it's 17 to get a driver's license. Interesting. So, really? You know, the judgment of a 16-year-old could be a little bit uh, whew, curious. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. So. so so did you, all the years you've been flying, ha- have you ever had, um, you know, any close calls, any any white knuckle moments, any situations where you were like, oof. Well, you know, I've been flying a long time. I've got over 4,000 hours of flying time. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's. It, I would say it would be pretty rare to not have something. I mean, you know, driving down the highway every day, something sure. happens. Right, yeah. absolutely. Um, yeah, when I was doing uh, some commercial rides years ago, I, I had a, um, uh, a passenger uh, grab the stick uh, and um, excuse me. We grabbed the stick. He was sitting in front. Actually, I was sitting in the back. And is this is a glider or a. Th- this was in a glider. A glider okay. He grabbed the stick. I didn't realize what was going on, and and we were in a pretty dangerous situation. And once I figured out what he had done, uh, it was mostly a panic situation on his part. Mm. Um, he released the stick. We got the plane fixed and back down on the ground, but it was a scary wow. moment. So. And he was not a licensed glider pilot? No, no, he was just a passenger. He was a paid, pa- you know, he was paying for a ride. I was working for an airport at the time. Gotcha. And okay. uh, um, I would say that that put a little fear in me that day. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> we flew another day. Okay, well, that's good. <laughs> and there's yeah. been other things, you know, again, uh, flying for all those years, there's lots of little things that have happened over the years. But for the most part, you know, aviation is is relatively safe, mm-hmm. um, executed properly, airplanes that are maintained properly. Um, Way safer than driving. Well, yes. Um, you know, especially if you're going on long trips, it's faster. It's, uh, it's, it's you know, for us, it's a lot of fun. Right. We, we enjoy doing it. No, that's good. And yeah, I think your uh, your background also has an amazing story with the airport that you're uh, flying in and out of often. Um, I guess the combination of your contracting situation and your piloting side tell us a little story about the uh, the airport so it was very interesting how you came to uh, be a part well, of the airport that that's just happened um mm-hmm. that wasn't planned that wasn't a goal mm-hmm. that was something that happened uh, i just happened to be i suppose at the right place at the right time um the airport was in jeopardy of being sold um and for our audience, the name of the airport and location? The uh, name of the airport is Sky Manor Airport. It's in uh, Pittstown, New Jersey. Okay. Uh, it's been there since, I'm really not sure exactly when, <laughs> but probably since the 30s or 40s. Okay. Uh, it's a great place, um, and we can go more into that. But um, I got brought in because I had been around aviation long enough. I have a background, of course, in construction and understand a little bit about buying and selling parcels. Um, there were ultimately seven of us that were brought in to, to kind of put this deal together. Um, it ended up being six of us when it was all said and done. And then we had to basically sell shares. We had to sell interest in doing this mm. uh, to raise capital, to raise money, and to move the project forward. I thought it was absolutely ludicrous. I didn't think it was <laughs> going to happen. I thought there were too many um, what ifs, hurdles and what ifs and 60 liens on the property. And I can't even go into even, it's just was, it was crazy. And wasn't this back like 2008 this or so? 2008 Not is the when best we of closed. Times. No, it was a terrible time. Yeah. It's a good point. Yeah. Um, we were in, in, in talks of buying the airport. Um, I remember driving to one of the members or to one of my um, uh, uh, partners Mm -hmm. and um, the market had taken, you know, a major dip that particular day. And I was frightfully scared of of get involved in this venture. Um, We Mm -hmm. each had to put up. A fair amount of, of not as much money, but a lot of collateral. Okay. And um, I was concerned, you know, airports fail often, and uh, I just didn't want to be in that position. Um, so we went back and renegotiated. So I think in the long run, it helped us out because mm-hmm. we were able to renegotiate our numbers. Because of the drought. Yeah, we basically said, listen, guys, you know. We don't out. know what's going on with the economy. Yeah, we're, we're just going to walk away. And we were still in a position where we could do that. Right. 
Um, the bank wasn't thrilled about us walking away, so they were willing to negotiate. And, uh, you know, we ended up getting the airport and selling 22 shares at the time, um, which raised enough capital for us to move forward. And, you know, the rest is a Cinderella story because mm. the, the airport's been extremely successful. Um, we have sold more shares over the years. Uh, we have no more to sell. Mm -hmm. um, they were sold out quite a few years ago. The airport is profitable. The airport is successful. The airport is probably one of the prettiest, nicest, well-maintained airports, in New, certainly in New Jersey and maybe wow. around the country. And it's because it's solely owned by pilots. Um, nobody's making any income from this. This is solely to keep this airport a gem of New Jersey. Is this common, like amongst airports? or is this No, <laughs> it's, it's really not. And there's been articles written about it because... It is a way of saving an airport right. because it, it's it's hard to make money. If 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 six of us wanted to make a six figure salary, it's it's not there. Right. It's it's not there. But if the money goes back into the airport to keep the buildings up and to keep the runways in good shape and to keep the lawn cut and all the other things, all the that regulations we do, that are involved, it's, it's a tremendous amount of work. And the mm -hmm. six of us. You know, I, I can speak so highly of, of, of my, my, my uh, partners and, and our members. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's taken a tremendous amount of effort. And, you know, it's, uh, for, for the members uh, or for the partners, you know, we've worked really hard. But without the members, it doesn't happen. Right. You know, we need their support. We certainly needed their money. And um, there's not one that's unhappy about buying a share in our, in our airport. Now, can, can someone who doesn't have a share land there? Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, so uh, it's a public-use airport. It's a private airport, but it's a public-use airport, so anybody can land there. We don't charge any money for that. Oh, okay. They can come in. They can have lunch at the Sky, Sky Cafe, which is run by Rosella, who does a great job. Um, I, I've been there. The food's really good. Yeah, I mean, it's just a wonderful place. Yeah. We, we love having kids and families, and during COVID was interesting because – you know, people couldn't do their typical trips, whether that was to the beach, whether that was to the city or wherever. Mm -hmm. So they wanted to get out of the house. So where'd they go? They go to Sky Manor. They set, set a, a beach towel out by the runway with mm -hmm. a picnic basket. And there were hundreds of people out there. Just watching planes land well, and well, take off? It's either that or they sit home and stare at the wall. Right, so, right. Very so watching airplanes was a fun thing. So it was and safe. Then, it was yeah, and it was, it was great. I mean, and we don't discourage that at all. We never do. That's and what uh, that's what we want this place to be. We want it to be a place where people enjoy being and enjoying aviation. And we've inspired so much because of it. And, and many, many, many people have learned to be pilots because of just coming there as a kid and seeing what goes on. And we hear the stories. It's, it's, now, it's now, you impressive. have a uh, charity uh he, uh, a scholarship. Out, a scholarship for yes. Us. So, uh, so for we run a scholarship. We run the Don Gordon Scholarship. Um, Don Gordon was a dear friend of mine, and uh, he was on the board of the committee that put this scholarship together. And when he passed away, um, uh, we decided to, to name the scholarship after him, okay. um, which had many benefits. Um, one of the benefits are that many of his friends and, and have donated sizable amounts of money um, to help this scholarship move forward. And it's been very successful. We've had five kids that we've, five, I believe, five children that we've given scholarships to. We've given over $10,000 in scholarships and um, plan to grow it even more. Now, yes. now, the scholarship fund, is it it's a basically for aviation? Yes. It's, um, the students have to meet a, a, a minimum criteria, which is, uh, is, is, is outlined. Uh, they follow that. And, um, you know, two years ago, or th maybe just prior to COVID, we gave away um, two scholarships. We had really planned on doing only one, mm -hmm. but we had two great candidates, and we just could not <laughs> see not giving both of them. It was just, how can you deny somebody who's so qualified? Right. And so we came up with the money, and we gave two scholarships. And they use the, the money towards learning how to be pilots? Yeah, the money goes... Uh, uh, directly to the flight school, and they can use that money towards any aspect of learning to fly. And in many cases, by the time they get our money, they are probably half or three quarters into their flying. Okay. So that money usually gets them over the either 
gets them their license or pretty darn close to it. What what age are they typically the recipients? Well, you know, our our uh, scholarship really doesn't have an age limit, but mm-hmm. I would say most of the kids have been relatively young. I would say under twenty five. Okay. And uh, some even younger. We just gave one recently when he was 18. Um, going to be going to, uh, actually, he's going, I'm not sure where he's going to school, actually. Um, but he's going to aviation school. Right. And uh, he plans to be a pilot, become a commercial pilot. And nice. he was inspired. He lives literally within the airport area. And he said, you know, I was always looking outside and looking at the airplanes. And, yeah. and for him, it was just a matter of time. And, and the scholarship will help him, you know, get over the hump. Nice. Nice. Yeah. And set a course in the future. Yeah. Them to, yeah. yeah, it's great. And that's, that's, and that's listen, as pilots, we, we, we need people to, 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 to fill that void. Right. We, we need, you know, pilots for, of course, for us to get to the, to the islands and to all the places sure. we like to travel to. And um, it's just giving back. You know, I think that's one of the things that I feel is important. I've been involved in aviation for th- over 35 years. And the idea that I can now give back is a uh, is, is wonderful thing. It's, I've, I've came from nothing, and now I'm giving back. So I think that's a... Uh, that is really nice. Yeah. So how often do you talk to a lot of people who are thinking about, like maybe middle-aged folks... Um, who decide that they want to get involved in this. Well, I speak to them all the time. The middle-aged folks are the worst ones. They, they, <laughs> they, they, they want to do it, but um, I'm not sure they they have the real passion to do it. Right. You know, it's always about the kids going to school, and I understand there's, right, there's right. a cost uh, involved. But life is short. Sometimes right. you have to just go for it. Yeah, if it's a passion, you gotta follow do it. it. Yeah. So you see, do, do, do you guys see a lot of newcomers come through? Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, we do have a flight school at the airport. I'm not involved with the flight school. That's a separate entity. But uh, the flight school's been busy and COVID has made um, flying unusually busy or new new people learning to fly. Again, I think people have looked at it and said, you know what? I've always wanted to do it. Life is short. Right. Let's do it. Sure. Um, Like much of everything in the world these days, um, things have gotten to be more expensive, but airplanes have gone up exponentially. Really? Really? And and it's odd because we've had a pilot shortage for as long as I've been involved in, in flying. And now all of a sudden, planes are very expensive, mostly used. New planes are extremely expensive, but even used airplanes have gone up, in some cases, double or triple. Really? And uh, I don't know what's driving that. I don't know if people are just saying, you know, I'm just going to buy an airplane because there's no more pilots today than there was 10 years ago. But yet, but yet there's there's more people, I think, that are getting in general aviation and mm-hmm. want to buy an airplane and, and and it's driving the price up. Interesting. Wow. Yeah, I guess like houses and cars <laughs> and everything else. There's it's, nothing cheap out there. No. So, so through your uh, career as a pilot, you, you've how far have you gone? Like what's the longest trip you've gone? Um... You know, uh, I, I would say the longest trip, I, I've been down to Key West. Um, I've been out west, but I've never gone out that far. Yeah. Um, Have you, you, you made like a couple stops on the way to Key yeah, West? Yeah, so in uh, the one back. airplane, I could make uh, South Florida with one fuel stop. Um, oh, okay. Uh, but every airplane is different. There's some planes you may have to make five fuel stops to get there. There's some are slower, faster. Do, do you, you know. enjoy the trip, though? That's what it's all about. Yeah, right. you know, it's it's not the destination; it's the trip. trip right? Well, you know, in most cases, you can get on the airlines; it's a lot cheaper. But that's, right. anybody can do that. Yeah, right. but you're flying. You're flying. You're you're. You know, it's it's like playing chess. Mm-hmm. You know, it's you get in the airplane. There's a lot to do. You're not just sitting there with the autopilot on. In many cases, right. you're always kind of busy. You're always thinking about what's next. What's the weather doing up ahead? You know, you're covering hundreds and hundreds of miles weather changes Absolutely. and you have to be prepared for that if if there's low um ceilings in certain areas well you have to deal with that right right now you i read somewhere you built your own plane well i did <laughs> he's you a builder know. Know. <laughs> well yeah I, I don't know if it translates from construction of houses uh, you know. <laughs> two by four is a two by four <laughs> well you know my my wife brings it up quite a bit i don't talk that much about it because I'm, I'm certainly happy to talk to it about uh, to aviators, to, to pilots, but when people think that you built an airplane, they think you got it out of the back of popular mechanics. <laughs> and it's really not that way. Um, many of the planes that are being built today, in fact, I, my plane was built in 2007, but what is being built today is incredible. Mm. Um, 
um, they they supersede many of the uh, certified built airplanes. And by the way, these these do have to meet requirements. They're mm. they're not ultralights, which have virtually no regulation. Right. There are always regulation, and and but these planes are fast. They're technically advanced in many cases huh. you know there's there's commercial airplanes that don't have the technology and i'm not kidding really that have the technology that is incredible really um, are these kits like uh, dare you call well, them kits well or? when i when i say kit you know the plane may come and look like a partial bit of an airplane right. there's a company vans aircraft uh in oregon that produces the most popular of the aircraft kits there's almost 11,000 flying, mm, and there's wow. probably double or triple that being built. Some may never fly. Right. Some will fly. Um, but they're... Why know, would you build something that's never going to fly? Well, see, their intentions are for them to fly. Oh, right? okay, 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 okay. But it's, um, you know, the easy part is... Uh, is buying the kit is finishing the kit is the hard part. It, it's yes. hard. It's it's a lot of work. Um, you have to be diligent. I spent four years, um, and uh, I would say the average build is every bit of that long. Four years. Wow. wow. It's not like a model, I guess. You click into the. <laughs> no, and you know, and you and you have to learn a lot, and you have to. Um, it, it's it's a lot of it's a lot of work. Did it make it's, you a better pilot? Um, probably no. not. Made me understand the mechanics of an airplane much more. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, 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 I've become a much better mechanic. Uh, you know, I'm, I, I have a, a re, what's called a repairman's license. That's, uh, that can be achieved when you build your own airplane. So I can now maintain my airplane. Mm -hmm. um, I can't work on anybody else's airplane. Right, right. That being said, you know, the safety of these airplanes are, are pretty high, very high, not pretty high. Um, and the, the, the people that fly them are exceptional. They're really good pilots. Did any? Did you go to anybody after you built it? Be like, do you want to go up first time with me in my plane? And well, be like, whoa! <laughs> I, I, I have to say that um, no, nobody's ever not wanted to go for a ride. That's honestly. Good. That being said, my wife was the first one in the back seat. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. That's wow. Funny. That yeah. That's that's that's, uh, that's that sounds very impressive. And you, you dedicated to it because it's going to take some time. And, and that's well, there were times I was willing to not be so dedicated. Right. But so do you have like? I mean, you don't put this. Like you, have, you have hangar space. Like where do you build an airplane? Well, not so in the basement. Yeah, not in the basement. So well, it, the, it, in my case, it was. No. Now, <laughs> it's not that my basement is so big, but um, the plane is. You know, there's two wings, a fuselage, right, yeah, yeah, tails, yeah. and everything. So it could be done really in Piece a mail? small garage. Okay. Honestly, the bigger the space, the better. But I, I, I did it in my basement. I was able to take the parts. I had a walkout basement. Mm -hmm. Um, so most of it got built there. Then it got finished in a hangar and spent a few months, you know, get everything queued up. And the FAA sends a representative. They come out. They inspect it. They look at the airplane. It, it's really, you are the manufacturer. Mm -hmm. gotcha. uh, Vans or the aircraft company sends you parts, and you are the manufacturer. Um, so you sign off on it. Right. So uh, that's the way it works. But. It's a it's a good community and it's it's pretty well regulated and it's um, it's not there's not planes flying out falling out of the sky. No, it's, no, it's no. pretty pretty well um, pretty well uh, maintained and uh, it's it's been great. It's been really very good for aviation. A any pilots I ever met though, they're they're, they're yeah they're pretty disciplined. You know. Yeah, modern take something you know, special, I yeah, think, to, like, to, you know, to do that. So. Even keeled fellows, you know. Well, yeah. some of them are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't run in the same. We don't run in the same circle. Do, the same so, circle. Yeah. so, how many airplanes have you owned, and how many do you own now? Uh, so, I, I, I've owned uh, four airplanes uh, over the years. I own two now. Mm -hmm. So, I have a, a Vans RV8, and uh, I have a, a T34, which is a military trainer, mm. and. Um, that was a that's a long story in itself but basically you know i've got involved in doing formation flying and um, i've been involved with the t-34 association and a uh, great group of guys um, probably the hardest flying i've ever done um, mm. i spent easily a year and a half to two years working on getting my qualification for formation um, and then you start flying close to a lot of guys I mean, wow. literally close. Yeah. To, yeah, you're yeah. within three feet in many cases. Whoa. And, and um, it's an interesting group of guys. They all have to be qualified, and you trust your life 
with them. With them. How many will be in formation typically? It depends. You know, many times we're flying amongst four is typically what you do. But when you're at it with Oshkosh, Wisconsin, which is the world's largest air show in the world, mm-hmm. um, it is um, we'll come in there with as many as 25 uh, airplanes wow. in a in a segmented formation. Um, it's a kick. It's uh, it's incredible and. I could just tell you one quick story. I, my first time I went to Oshkosh was 1988, and it is an amazing place. If, mm-hmm. if, if you've never been out there, it is uh, unbelievable. There's well over 10,000 airplanes that show up there. It covers hundreds of acres. It's just it's so big, it's unbelievable. Wow. Like, that being for, said, yeah. it is the premier place for air show people, for airplanes, for anything aviation. Um, and I went there in 1988, and I was just blown away. And back in 2015, I got to fly in the show, in the formation, into Oshkosh. Mm. And that was, um, for me, probably one of the high points for my aviation career. How many were in formation with you then? Uh, there was probably about 24 or 5 at that time. That's awesome. And uh, our lead, um, who uses certain terms, and he calls out what's going on. Basically, I'm a wingman. My job is to stay in a position and just stay there no matter what. Right. Um, but he will uh, he will call out, okay, guys, showtime, which means right. buck up, get right. And, uh, you know, if you were a little loose, now's the time to tighten it up because now people are watching. And I remember when he said it, and here we are flying into the world's biggest air show in the world, and yeah. I came here as a relatively young kid watching these air show pilots and now i'm in the show um wow. choked me up right yeah. it was a big deal yeah it's like the rock band fantasy yeah. of being up on yeah. stage yeah. and so how many wow. passengers can your um i only take one passenger oh yeah. so that's it just one just one yes. plane is relatively large but and uh, it's um it's it was designed to train military pilots no i meant your other plane uh both of them are single seaters in fact the other one is quite small yeah it's fast, but it's small. Wow. So is it is it comfortable on a long ride? Like you can't use the restroom or something uh, like that? Restrooms like, are not available. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, so if you're going all the way down there to like Key West or something like that. Yeah, like so you usually make you I want us- to break usually it up, we'll right? make a stop in um, North Carolina or even South Carolina and then go from there. So, you know, you're talking about a two and a half to three hour leg. Right. Um, the plane is small, um, but it's fast. It flies well, around 200 miles an hour. Okay. And, um, you know, it, it gets there. It gets there, yeah. Uh, yeah. So we were reading about you and your bio. What is this Mount Everest stuff? Well, I... Um, an so your Instagram, it's like an you ev- saw the Instagram and kind of saw some pictures from that. Like, Adventurous type wow. of guy. Well, uh, that came up. Uh, I was on a trip with my brother-in-law, and uh, we were actually out in... Uh, in Tucson, Arizona, heading up towards uh, Las Vegas. And um, he asked me a question. He says, where would you want to go if you can never go anywhere? I said, well, you know, I've never been to Hawaii and I'd like to go a little more to Europe. And, and he says, well, I'd like to go to Base Camp Everest. Well, once he said that, I was like, well, I've always wanted to do that, but I didn't think you could do that. Right. And he said, no, no, there's companies that will take you out there and do all this stuff. So... We got to the hotel that night, and I started chipping away at it. And uh, within about three months, I came up with the company that we wanted to go with. And we spent a year training. And uh, What what was the training like? uh, Training was mostly just hiking a lot, doing some hills and stuff. You you really can't train for the altitude. Right. And... Honestly, the altitude is, is uh, doesn't matter what kind of shape you're in. It's going to yeah. affect you. Pe- people get affected very differently by right. altitude. Hmm. What is the altitude of base camp? So base camp is around 17,500, almost 18,000 feet in most cases. And, you know, anything above 12,000 feet for most people is, is above and beyond where they need to go. But, you know, the, the one thing when we, when we went out there, we flew into Kathmandu and spent a few days there and then on our way. And... Um, you know, we flew into, which was just a bucket list for me, was the, the most dangerous airport in the world, which is in, uh, um, which is in Kat, um, Lukla. And uh, it's very short. It's uh, right, in the, uh, right in front of you is a, you know, probably an 8,000 foot mountain. And wow. uh, they either do it right or you crash. I mean, there's wow. not too many options. So we got to fly into Lukla. 
and then we start our journey, and we spent uh, almost three weeks in the mountains between getting up and getting back. And the reason that it takes so long, besides all the hiking that you have to do, is you have to climatize. So oh. you, you typically climb high, um, sleep low. That's the philosophy. So your, your, your uh, blood, um, blood uh, red blood cells develop, and, and you, mm. you have the ability to... Well, climb high, sleep low. Explain that. So you will, for instance, there's days where you'll, you'll be at maybe 12,000 feet, and you'll hike up to 14,000 feet, maybe 14,500, spend the day, maybe have lunch, and then go back down to 11,000 feet and sleep. So you're, to you're acclimate. You're acclimating okay. your body, and uh, for the most part, I had very little issues. I was p- pleased by that. I was very concerned um, of the altitude. Uh, we did have some people that didn't make it, and it's very, it's didn't very make it. Uh, Alive, but not. No, no, nice. no. They, they survived <laughs> the survived. trip. Um, uh, but uh, many people just can't make that, the higher altitudes. Right. It's, it's, and and it, again, it doesn't matter what kind of shape you're in. Uh, well, how old were you when you did it? I was 55. Okay. Wow. So, that's so um, I would say there's no limit to go to base camp. Now, again, went to base camp, and the, 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 the organization uh, that I went with, um, they, um, they had a special kind of a special program. There's a few companies that will let you stay at base camp. There's many people that hike to the base camp, um, but they're not allowed to stay there. Because they, the companies don't have the support. So the company we went with uh, uh, gave us the ability, because they're an expedition team, they're taking people to the summit of Everest. That's what they do for a living. And they have tents and, and, and chefs and everybody to, to keep you at, at base camp. So we <laughs> stayed there for three nights. It was just incredible sleeping on a glacier. Um, what is the height at base camp again? Uh, 17.5. 17.5. Wow. And I can tell you that if the average person just flew in at 17.5 and showed up, they would probably not survive. Really? Um, or certainly have very serious issues. You, you have to the climatize. Shock to the body. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, everybody has to climatize. It's yeah. not just you know, mm. the guy that's never been there before. Right. Everybody does. Wow. Um, even, you know, all these, these, these guys that are going to attempt Everest are doing the same thing. So the trip that we took, which was long, a little expensive, but it was, it was worth every penny. Nice. So it now, was, from base camp, what I remember, they watched the weather. Oh, God, yeah. And, and then, the, yeah. <laughs> you could watch the weather. The, you have no choice. Yeah. But, I mean, if you want to go to the summit... There's a, sometimes there's only a small window. The window is small. It's usually a week or so. And, and um, you know, the, the great thing for me was to get to see really the behind the scenes of what it takes to go up that mountain. Yeah. And uh, it's incredible. Um, you know, met so many really great people. I met some of the finest climbers in the world out there. And uh, it's hard. It's miserable. It's lonely. It's... Um, uh, it's beautiful, the most beautiful place I've ever been. It's yeah. um, I, I can't even Seems describe. Crazy, right? I, I can't describe the beauty. Right. Um, um, it's you know we were staying in tents. Um, once we got to Lobache, we stayed in tents for three nights there, climatizing, and then eventually we pushed to the summit or to the base camp. I'm sorry, and then we spent three nights up there. So you know nightly lows were probably in the single digits. Um, <sighs> And I'm not much of a camper, so <laughs> so this made it interesting. I didn't know how it was all going to play out. Right. But, you know, when in Rome, do what yeah. you got to do. And we were prepared. We had the right equipment. We had the right mindset. And we just made it happen. And it's the best thing I've ever done. It's this really incredible trip. Really, really incredible. Was base camp very populated? I mean, did, did people hear you mean, yeah. people hear that base camp are, is getting to be like not a lot of trash and stuff like that, but you know, it's well, definitely the better, used. Well, the, the company, um, International Mountain Guides is the company we went with, a great, great group out of Seattle. Um, uh, they're, they leave nothing on the mountain. And, and by the way, the policy now is nothing gets left on the mountain. Right. Um, that being said, you know, always something gets left behind. Right, yeah, but, right, right. but they really, I can tell you that all the major companies work really hard um, at not leaving anything behind. Mm. Um, and um, it's it's just an incredible journey. And um, yes, it, 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 it was 
it was busy when we were up there, but we were there early in the season. We were there in April. Um, really, the push for the summit doesn't happen until sometime in May. Okay. And you have to remember that these climbers have to work for over a month, almost every day, climatizing, meaning that they'll go up to base, they'll go up to camp one, mm-hmm. s- maybe spend the night, come on back down, spend a few days back down, go up to camp two, maybe spend a night or two, come back down. But these journeys, every time you go through, Takes you're, a little you're bit going out, yeah. through the Kumbu Icefall. Mm-hmm. That is a mousetrap of deadliness. Oh, it's man. it's uh, more people die in the ice fall than any place on the mountain. And when you see it, you these these fissures that go down forever and you see these shiracks of of ice hanging over um, the, the the area in which they're trekking or hiking. Uh, they start usually at one in the morning. And they're usually out of that area before the sun comes up because when the sun comes up, things get soft and start Uh to move. Right. So very deadly area. They're up there at nighttime? That's the the only time to get through there. And that's, what, between base camp and the summit? Or because yes. Okay. So and so there's camp one, camp two, three, four. Did you just stay at base camp or did you venture up? No, 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 no. No, that costs too much money to get up there and too much training. Oh, yeah. really? It's, so base it, camp, you're happy at. Yeah. Right. Right. It's really... Uh, I'd be happy that way. Yeah, me too. You, you, you really... But, and again, to get to see Everest, and believe it or not, Everest, though it's the, the highest mountain, it's not the most visible mountain. Um, Why you is that? It's clouds? Just, it's so... Well, in mu- many of the cases, it's covered by clouds, but uh, for the most part, it's, it's deep within the mountains, and it's just kind of covered. It doesn't just stick up there like a thorn. It's... it's uh, there's hmm. other mountains that are visible, uh, that are beautiful mountains, but that mountain you don't see until kind of late into the trip. And I remember the first day we saw it, it was like seeing a rock star. It was just like, yeah. this wow. is so cool. We're seeing it with our own eyes. Because you're at, what, 17 at base camp, and yes. that's, what, 29? It's 29, f- nine's change. It's, okay. it's, it's, it's wow. Well, no, 20, uh, 29, 29, I don't, I don't remember. That's two more miles higher than you. So, hey. yeah, yeah, it's 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 way up there, and, <sighs> um, yeah. It's it's a long journey, and, and this and it, is the Himalayas, right? It's deep in the Himalayas. It's it's interesting when you're at base camp, you don't see Mount Everest. Huh. You have to um, you have to hike back a few miles to get up on this little ridge, and then you can see Mount Everest. So when you're at, it's being blocked by other mountains. Sure, but you know when you're there at night, you know you you hear the glaciers moving. You know you hear the ice cracking underneath your tent. It's uh, <laughs> crazy, <laughs> crazy, crazy. <laughs> And if you don't acclimate yourself, what's the medical impairment that happens to you? Um, so there's, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I should know this better, but... Uh, it's not like the bends or anything. Uh, you know? No, it's not the bends, like it was from scuba diving, but there's uh, all kinds of lung conditions. You get fluid in your lungs. Mm-hmm. And uh, in some cases, it's it could be very deadly. And people do die right. um, going up to base camp. That's not... It's not totally uncommon Hmm. um that being said if you go with a better group they will they will recognize that long before it gets to that that kind of issue but the the only way to fix these problems is to get low to get you back to lower or back to Kathmandu. Kathmandu is at 4500 feet Mm -hmm. um so um yeah pulmonary edemas that's that's one of the issues that you run into okay and it's uh it's it's uh, it's a it's a thing that you have to watch for, wow. and, and good guides will keep an eye on it for you, and they'll, sure. they'll see it. Coming so let me ask you: about it. You said in the beginning of the podcast, your parents were sort of just simple, <laughs> like just just yeah, regular jokes, right? I, yeah. And and like you though have seemed to like. Is it because you dream things? Like, um, like or, or you just I, had? I'm the not sure. I'm smart enough to not know to do these things. <laughs> Uh, you, that's, you know, that's good too. That's I mean, good. That works, you know what I mean? But you seem like you live a, 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 like the opposite of your dad. Yeah, I think I do. I think you know my dad came from much poor background. He would live through the depression. You know, it's just a different different world, world right? Mm-hmm. right. It wasn't uh, didn't have the opportunities you had afforded. He he didn't make these things. Uh, he didn't expose me to it per se, but he didn't stop me either. Right, right. And um, you know, I think once you get a little taste of some of these things, you kind of want more. Um, yeah. And it's not like I'm a daredevil or any of those things. It's not my MO. It's just that I just love seeing stuff. And I've said before, you know, I only got one chance. So I'm going to take advantage as much as I can. 
Cool. Okay, so you've bought an airport, went up Mount Everest to the base camp, the formation flying, build your own plane. Where do we go from here? Yeah, what's next? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I'm running out of stuff to do. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. I think, I think Mike Tyson is ready to take <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I'll give him, uh, I'll, I'll let him win. <laughs> I... Um, I really don't know what's next. Um, you know, I'll just see what happens. Um, you know, almost everything that I've I've kind of achieved or that I wanted to achieve kind of came to me. Mm -hmm. um, the aviation thing, you know, I found it and and I worked around it. And buying the airport was one of those things that was just a byproduct of being at the right place at the right time. Right. Um, you know, the friendships, the people f that I've made from the airport. Uh, my wife, I met through flying. Um, so, you know, flying has been just the nucleus and it's the reason i go to work you know it's it's you know we all have a reason to go yeah, to passion work. yeah passion it's just it's a wonderful thing and again i can't explain it it's just one of those things that i just love to do and and love being involved with and without the airport i don't know what i would do i i might I, you know i couldn't play that much golf i don't know i don't right. know what i could do that's yeah. awesome that's awesome and I, I love the fact that you have this uh you're part of this charity and trying to help that next generation experience the things you guys experienced yeah, yeah it's given back yeah, and it's given uh, back are, and are there a need for more pilots in a well, lot of different capacities it, it, right now the aviation world i mean if 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 anybody wants to become a commercial pilot this is the time to dive in oh, really? uh there is a lack of pilots and it's only going to get worse so um it's almost an assured career hmm. if you have quote the right stuff you know um really if if you if you go Go to school and work on getting your ratings, whether that's through a, a commercial school or you go to a, a, a local flight school mm -hmm. through a college. Uh, it's definitely a career path. And, you know, it's a it's a real job. I mean, oh, you know, yeah. pilots make good money. Um, it's uh, it's a notable career and, and we need new pilots. We really do. Mm -hmm. um, pilots have been in the decrease for years. Right. Um, and I think now it's picking up a little bit. But um, uh, yeah, we'll see. Uh, do you see a lot of female pilots? I would say. Um, well, what's the breakdown? Of yeah, it's a good of, point. I would say maybe it's twenty five percent. Twenty five percent. Yeah. As far as the, the type of planes you you fly. Yeah. yeah, I would say so. And maybe that may be high and low. It just it ebbs and flows. Ebb and flows comes up a little bit. You know, I have a client who's female and, and she has five kids. So God bless her. Well, and, and she's a pilot? And she's a pilot, yeah. Wow. Yeah, and I think that is one of the issues um, of women being pilots. It's not that they're not equally capable. It's that in many cases they're they're bringing up children yeah. and uh, they don't want to take the risk. Yeah, and you know things have changed too. You know we live in a different world where mm -hmm. you know women are having children. They're 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 executives. They're CEOs. It, it's different than it was years ago. So they could be pilots just as sure. Well. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I was just curious if well, what what the what the numbers were that you've seen. I just know? think that girls, you know, their 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 mother gives them a Barbie doll. And the son gets an airplane. Yeah. Oh. So they're 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 kind of driven um, in different directions. In a different direction. Doesn't mean very that, interesting. Very you interesting. know. So if you want some more female pilots, give the girls airplanes to play with. Exactly. If you or take them out to the airport. Yeah. Yeah. Get yeah, them. yeah inspire well, listen, them young. Bring them out anytime. We'd love yeah. to have them at the airport. That's very interesting. Very interesting. That's good. It's uh, so nothing. Nothing planned for the future, no major next endeavors at this point. No, you know, COVID kind of clamped down on a few things. Um, you know, we've got uh, our formation season starting soon, so we'll start training and getting prepared. And we go out to Oshkosh and uh, uh, Sun and Fun down in Florida. And, you know, there's, there's formation flying throughout the country. Mm -hmm. So that gets going now. But, um, no, it's uh, it's been kind of simmered down a little bit everything is a little more quiet um yeah. airport our airport is always busy as the the uh the spring starts to unfold we'll get more pilots and more people flying and then mm -hmm. more um uh, people walking in and enjoying the airport as as we that's what we push that's that's our goal right so for for say kids who are looking at becoming pilots 
you said 16 was the age for glider or yeah for glider so they um students can learn oh geez i should know this better you you can you can fly in an airplane with an instructor i think at 14 Mm -hmm. but you can't get your license until 17 okay so most kids are going to start in their 15 to 16 year range and by the time they're 17 they're they're capable of getting their license um, it usually takes most kids about a year or so to get a license, okay. depending on weather. Um, yeah. um, if they're going to school to do it, it, sometimes they can knock it out in months. Okay. Um, because, you know, they're doing it every day, all day. Right. Right. Right, right. Whereas most of the time they don't have enough money to get a license. A license is not cheap these days. It could range probably from ten to $15,000 to get a license. Good to go the full distance to get everything from all the training and everything. Well, yeah. And, you know, most, most... Pay for time, right? Yeah. So, you know, a private license is what you get first. Mm-hmm. And then you can move to a, either a commercial. Most people will go for their instrument rating, then a commercial license, and then instructor's rating if that's what you choose to do um but you know they're all expensive they take time and effort and if you're a student there's only so much time in the day to do this stuff mm. yeah but you know if you want to do it i say do it yeah. so as we come down to the end here any advice for people um middle age just on uh, go go grab what you want before the time's up well i just i listen i've told many people this that even if you don't get your license Get into an airplane with an instructor and fly. Mm-hmm. And you know, if it's not your if it's not your thing, then that's okay. But but don't let the opportunity go away. And by the way, there's really no age limit. Yeah, I mean, if you can get a medical, which is not all that difficult, a medical re- basically is a requirement that you have to get minimally every two years, and uh, n- not in all cases, by the way. But um, if you can get a medical and go learn to fly, yeah. You won't, you won't regret it. Uh, I don't see how. <laughs> it's kind of like a base camp Everest, right? You know, situation, experience. What are you going to do? Well, yeah, no, I mean, that's, that I, would be amazing. I can tell you that I've flown with many people who are much older, who, who are not pilots, who said, you know, I wish I did this earlier. Mm-hmm. So why, why wait to say that? Don't you don't know? So I say move forward, do it. Awesome. How about skydiving? Done that twice. Okay. <laughs> Thoughts on that? Um, I'm done doing it. <laughs> Actually, it's 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 a kick. Um, I did it a little bit differently than most people, but you know they've got these tandem jumps that they do now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What a what a great deal! It's two hundred or two hundred fifty dollars. It's so worth it. Yeah. Ballooning is is great. Um, yeah, we we did ballooning last year. It was yeah, fun. It's it's lots of fun. You know, all this stuff. It's out there to experience. Why not take it? It was so quiet out yeah. there. Beautiful. When you open that, hear the dogs balloon. barking and everything. It's so quiet. <laughs> it's, it's crazy quiet. Yeah, for an aviator as myself, uh, it's unusual to be flying, you know, that slow, that low. Um, uh, it's it's unusual. I've been in helicopters. You know, I've been in almost everything that flies uh, outside of a blimp. I like helicopters. They're, they're fun. Yeah, they're, they're fun. amazing. We did one of those in Alaska. Yeah, that was fun. We went up to the top of a glacier. That was really cool. And then we went dog sled riding up there. It was pretty neat. And that's pretty neat. Yeah, so you got the guy put the music on, yeah. your headphones, so like you're going up around the glaciers and the mountains and really? you listen to the great music. It was pretty cool. Wow. Yeah, cool. We brought an airplane back about uh, eight years ago from Alaska, and it was a bit of a, it was a, bit of a journey. A little bit. Wow. <laughs> At 200 miles an hour. Yeah, well, not even that. It was a lot slower. A few stopovers, and, I imagine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, quite a few. <laughs> but, um, so you had to come across Canada, right? Yeah, we came right across Canada into Win- uh, across Edmonton into Winnipeg. So, what is it like? Do you have to do customs? Or uh, yes, we did, and this was well. Customs have been a lot harder since nine eleven right, to begin right, with. Right. But yeah, we came into International Falls, and uh, you know, you land. You have to file for all these things, so they know you're coming, and right. you get in. Uh, there's a, a circle about twice the size of the airplane, and you fly, and you taxi, and you put the plane in the circle, and you are not allowed to leave the circle. You can get out of the plane, but you can't leave the circle. Really? Until what? Customs it, officials Until customs come. come You're the, isolated in that circle. The circuit. dog comes and sniffs the airplane, and they, they check for explosives and All the fun tap you on the back, and off you go. Wow. wow. Then you can get something to eat and fuel up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then on to the next stop. Then on to Saginaw. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. Well, that was, Canada's, like, mostly desolate, right? You know, it, it, it's, it's funny you ask that. I was telling this story yesterday. Be, uh, I didn't. I didn't know what goes on up that far up in Canada. Right. I thought it was mountainous. It's prairie out there. Yeah. There's, Is it? Really? There's a lot of nothing up there. Yeah. 
A lot of nothing. A lot of nothing. A lot of cold area. But it's beautiful. It's just very little. Right, right. Wow. Yeah. Great time. Well, yeah, is there, I guess what we always like to ask, is there any questions that we didn't ask you that you think we should? Oh, I'm sure there's many. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just happy that I, I can talk about my passion and what I've done for a living. And, Absolutely. you know, the scholarship that I've been involved with uh, for, for five years. Um, uh, I think raising money and um, keeping kids in airplanes have been just a wonderful thing for us. And it's part of our, by the way, it's our, part of our EAA chapter. There's EAA stands for Experimental Aircraft Association. Mm -hmm. We have a chapter of about 60 members at our airport. And uh, we do all kinds of things from learning about working on airplanes to learning safety, mm -hmm. um, dealing with safety, um, uh, all aspects of flying, and it's a lot of camaraderie, good people. And our chapter, um, EAA 643, has been very active. We also do other scholarships that we get money from the EAA organization, and uh, we've given out three $10,000 scholarships, which for the most part gets a student, if, if not their license, pretty close to it. Nice. And we've been involved with that for now three years. Joe Preston has is, is run that and done a great job. And uh, it's, uh, that's been just really the backbone of our, our chapter. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think we were going in any great direction. And once we started getting into this scholarship thing, it just has, we just found a direction to go. Right. Something that was meaningful and, and worthy. Well, sometimes uh, it's better to give than receive. You get a better feeling. Yeah. Uh, yeah, as you get older, I definitely think that's the case. When you're younger, you want everything. But <laughs> right. as you get older, it's like you want to give back. And, yeah, absolutely. and I'm happy to be able to do that. I'm, uh, I, I look at all the years I've been involved in aviation. It's, it's amazing to, to see where I started and where I've become, you know, where I've gotten to. It's a great story. Yeah. Great story, Rob. And if people wanted to learn more about the scholarship, is there a place to go to, to get yeah, more Yeah, they detail? can go to our website, um, uh, Sky Manor website, it's, uh, I believe it's skymanor.com, mm -hmm. and they can go to a link on there, EAA Chapter 643, and I think they would find information on the scholarship. If, if not, they wanted to donate or something? Yeah, that would, we would love that. Uh, anything is, 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 is great. Um, and I think they can find that information. If not, they can go to our, our, our uh, Sky Manor website and find either my information or somebody else that can direct them. Cool. Okay. So and, if, and if they want to visit the airport, there's a great restaurant there. And you just come out, hang out for a Sky couple Cafe, hours. Sky Cafe. Sky right? Cafe yeah. in the summertime. It'll, you sit outside, watch the planes land. And it's a, it's a very nice. Yeah, it's, it's, I guess it's classified as the best little airport in the East. That is the best little airport, airport in the East. So. I'm sure there's some people that would argue that, but <laughs> I wouldn't. They're not on the show. No, I was going to say, that. <laughs> I have to dispute that. So. <laughs> well, thank you so much yeah. for coming out. We were yeah, really Adam, this has been great. This Adam Silverstein, thank you so much for thank coming you, out. Well, this is the Help Me on Middle East podcast. My name is Rob. And I'm Rob, too. And until next time, thank you. Thank Bye-bye, guys. Take care. Bye.